Um, I'm Jared Wolf, I, uh, also known as Circuit Dojo, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a custom extension that I built for VS Code uh, for working in Zephyr. Uh, I like that I'm following Jonathan's talk. Um, if you if you um, are using VS Code, I definitely recommend you go back and watch his talk when it becomes available online because it's a it's a good resource. I even learned some things about VS Code. So, well, let's get let's get started. Um, how I got started in uh, in Zephyr is uh, I made that board, and I've been kind of uh, I, I jumped in and I haven't really uh, haven't really stopped since, and it's been a crazy journey. So, um, that is a NRF9160, and uh, it's all based on Zephyr. So, uh, that's how I got here. Um, I also do live sessions on Zephyr, so if you haven't seen me, I'm on, I am on YouTube, and that, that is the link right there. So, uh, love to see you there in the live sessions, or you definitely can watch the uh, the ones that are already out. So, um, so big problem. Getting started with Zephyr, and I've, I've, I've talked about this ad nauseum, can be painful. I think everybody in the room probably understands that. Uh, it is the new hotness, though. Uh, so it's like we gotta we gotta figure out how to make it work. Uh, the, one of the craziest things and the coolest things is I can write one s single unified code base, change the target, and I can be running the same firmware on a completely different platform. Uh, that was actually my talk subject last year. So, but uh, what we're going to be talking about today is figuring out how to, how to use these tools a little bit easier. Uh, the list is long, MC Manager, West, Ninja, CMake. So let's, let's try to roll it into one if we can. Solutions. So, why not we why don't we make it easier for everybody? Uh, I had a lot of questions and concerns, and actually, just stumbling blocks from all the customers that were trying to work with my board. But I know it's kind of universal across Zephyr in terms of just the frustrations of getting things working correctly. I mean, I had it spelled out in documentation: X, Y, Z, do these exact steps, and there is always something on their machine, their Python version, or whatever. It's just like, it's just, it was, it was uh, really tough. And you're doing this remotely. It's not like I can sit down next to them and, hey, it's like, hey, you just have the wrong thing installed. It's just like emails back and forth. It's like, all right, let's, let's try to figure this out. So the solution was to uh, create an extension from scratch using a lot of, you know, using some um, of what other extension makers also had put in place for their extensions. Um, so I was just like looking at other extensions, you know, how they did things. So I just took, took it and, and ran with it. So the, the idea here is you're going from zero, so nothing, to getting your tool chain installed, getting all the utilities installed, um, being able to pull down a, at least a sample repository uh, and then compiling it and then running it or loading it somehow to a, a device that you might have connected to your machine like I have here, if you see that. And uh, the nice thing is that, uh, and also the, one of the main goals is to make sure that it works on everything. Uh, and that's probably one of the harder parts is just trying to figure, figure that one point out. So. I say 3.5 with an asterisk because I'm mostly talking about Mac and the fact that they changed architectures. So there are some tweaks for that. So I, I, I want to hit the easy button. It's a lot of, we're talking about making things easy. So the building of, so originally this was kind of closed source. I was kind of just doing it for customers, but I was like, this could benefit. I mean, just the fact that the room was full earlier is just the fact that uh, it's like, okay, there's a need here to make it easier for people to start using Zephyr and VS Code. Um, that is the link right there. You can definitely check it out. And um, it is written in TypeScript, which is uh, preferable rather than JavaScript for, um, in, in my opinion, at least things are typed. It's <laughs> crazy. Uh, here it is right here. So you can actually get it on the uh, extension marketplace today if you just go in the extension marketplace, search for Zephyr tools. Uh, I put a prefix of Circuit Dojo in there so people kind of understand that it's, it's coming from me, but it's all open source. Uh, so let's talk about an initialization of a project. So, or an initialization of your tools. So what will happen here is uh, we'll have a command here that will set up your, depending on your platform, it will set up all the tools and set up a Python uh, virtual environment in a specific folder in your home folder, no matter what architecture you're on, so Linux, Mac, Windows, and it'll put them all in the same place, 
and it knows where they live and they kn it knows how to get to those tools and actually set some paths while you're using it. Um, you can see there in the corner actually, that was, at, that was actually, I think I'm doing like a West update in the background there, but. Um, so it sets up, so the only thing you really need for any of this, any of this is you need Git and you need Python. That's the only requirement. I tried to tool around and like trying to figure out how to download Python for you, but uh, that's the one thing that's kind of complicated. So uh, you got to install Python, sorry. Um, and right now it's, it's geared towards ARM. Uh, there are some ways you can, I mean, that's one thing that um, I will pull, I put a call out to anybody who's interested. Uh, because it is open source, I'd love to make it a tool for everybody to use on every, all types of different tool chains. So um, maybe I'll put that call out earlier. If you're interested in helping, please uh, submit a PR. But, uh, and it'll also download CMake, Ninja, New, uh, New Manager. So I'm using New Manager only because I had to modify it for my board uh, for Mac. So for whatever reason, MCU Manager will not allow you to use, it's the serial library that they used in Go it wouldn't let you use anything faster than 152. So in order to transfer any images to NRF 9160, it would take like a minute and a half and that's just not doable. So, and uh, another thing that is there is uh, I created a Zephyr Tools CLI, it's coded in Rust and essentially it's just a serial monitor and it does some extra features and it, that's also open source. So you use it for logging. I have it pipe out to a, a log file. So when you're using your console, you'll have also a full log of whatever you're working on, all the output from your device. I've found it really useful for people, for clients, if you know, they're having trouble or something errors, at least it's automatically taking a log so they can just copy, paste, throw it in an email and send it to me or whatever. So, and again, um, you got to have those two things installed beforehand. So one of the concepts that I was working with was, all right, so how, how do I figure out this multi-platform problem? And the idea here is I, I, I found, I sourced all of the ex executables and kind of put them in this manifest format. So each, each platform has its own manifest where, and it points to the CMake and the Ninja and all of these executables, so they're all downloadable. They're all downloading, for the most part, from GitHub and public, uh, you know, open locations. And the nice thing is, it's it's it, this manifest file actually lives in the repo, so you actually see where they're being downloaded from. The only, only one that's being downloaded from somewhere else is uh, the custom um, MCU manager that uh, is needed for my particular board. But otherwise, it's just MCU boot or MCU manager. Uh, the, uh, and the nice thing is that it allows kind of fine grained control over the diff different architectures and plus uh, I also added, so I had some customers like, hey, we can't use this. We got M1 Max, we got M2 Max. It's like, oh, okay, time to make a different option. So not only can you kind of drill down to Linux or, or uh, in this case for Mac, it's you're drilling down from Mac, but you're also drilling down into x86, 64 and, um, and ARM. So those are all there and they're just providing different binaries. The nice thing about the Zephyr SDK is uh, there are a lot of uh, great, smart and hardworking people that got that working pretty fast. So um, for anybody who thinks Cat or uh, M1, I'm talking cellular language here, if, um, if you're using um, Apple and uh, with a new processor, Zephyr SDK is supported. So um, hopefully everybody knows that. Uh, Inside, so this is actually the TypeScript inside the code. This is where we're kind of sorting out the platform. Uh, you can just see that depending on, I'm essentially selecting the manifest depending on what is provided in, in the code itself. And then it goes, it just selects it and then you have the full list of binaries that'll go and download and put in place and set everything up. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, this could be improved or you can go crazy with it, you can go, you can have it so you can select all the different SDKs that are available for Zephyr um, or other utilities. I know there are a lot of other helper utilities and things that maybe not, are not included right now. So that's, uh, that's also another option, but uh, another plug, if you would like to contribute, I'd, I'd love to, love to um, help push that forward. 
So the, the next step would be to, so this is where I w would recommend people, uh, where I recommend customers, especially to start if they want to just start playing around is uh, initialize a repo and all it does is under the hood, a lot of these commands are just running west and um, it's just going to initialize to a specific repo and then also update and get you all the prerequisites and also install all the Python requirements. Because as, we, as we're jumping around to maybe different versions of Zephyr, uh, you're going to have to make sure that you have all those uh, prerequisite Python requirements or else things are not going to work and not build correctly. So this, this is me just putting in the, uh, the, the URL. You can actually specify for this, at least for, you can specify the branch um, and uh, it'll download everything and get it all installed for you. Uh, so this is a little opinionate, opinionated and I don't know if, if you saw one of the Goliath talks earlier yesterday, they, they have a certain way of like, they have like keeping everything in a certain place or the, in, in, cer in certain cases actually like downloading the full Zephyr SDK and all those dependencies and keeping them in the local folder and I like doing the same only because I find myself maybe, I find myself working in different versions of Zephyr all the time so if I'm always trying to switch between the two uh, inevitably it's, uh, it turns into uh, a train wreck. So having a specific Zephyr implementation or Zephyr c clone for one project and having them kind of all separated just keeps the sanity a little bit, uh, the sanity levels a little bit in the good direction. Um, downside takes up more space. So in the land and I think what uh, Mike said yesterday is like, it's like 2.3 gigs. I mean, we're living in the world of terabyte hard drives. It's not, not the big, big, biggest of deals. But I know some of you like working with uh, changing your Zephyr base. So, uh, one thing that's a new addition to the uh, the project is also having the ability to create a project. And what I'm, what, what's happening here is uh, you don't really have to do the init and clone the repo because that actually puts you down the very slippery slope of teaching people to like write your code in like the samples folder which is like the number one mistake that I made when I started playing with Zephyr is like oh I, I don't really know how to just like separate my app from everything else so I'm just going to put it in the, in the samples folder. So what this will do is actually take, right now it takes the Blinky sample, it clones it, it sets up a West manifest file depending on what uh, flavor of Zephyr you want so you can choose either NCS or vanilla at this point and vanilla is just the regular standard uh, Zephyr and then it'll pull your dependencies and set up any of your Python uh, requirements and it basically does a pip install with the requirements make sure you have the right things. So here's a quick little drop down and uh, we're just setting it up so in this case I'm just be selecting NRF connect SDK and uh, here is the actual kind of output of what happens here we're getting a CMake list prj.conf, a main file, and the west.yaml, uh, all very important. Uh, and this will at least get you started just with a blinky if you just want to blink some LEDs. Um, one thing, um, so say you want to add a dependency, uh, I'm a big fan of west, it makes things a lot easier. Um, Mike Stish from Goliath did a great talk on this yesterday too, uh, just adding dependencies to your West YAML and it's as easy as adding those lines and then um, running the, uh, the update dependencies command in VS Code. If you are, uh, hopefully this, some of you are familiar with when you're writing, you do like the command shift P or the control shift P and it'll give you that, uh, that command window where you can run these commands. But here I am, so this is kind of like the, the West file that got uh, generated and then you just put the dependency in in, the, in those lines there below and then we can actually do a quick west update and I'll fetch all the dependencies for that library. Now we're talking about building. So the, the, uh, the cool thing here is I, for the extension when you do a build for the first time it's going to ask you, all right, what's sampled or what, what application do I want to use? And then also what board am I building this for? So it does some trickery and it goes and searches through kind of the tree of everything that's 
uh, downloaded in your uh, kind of dependency folders and it will try to find all the available boards and also uh, the available projects. The projects will be limited to whatever application folder you have. So that's, that's one downside. Some people have reached out and they're like, hey, I really want to build this application in this like subfolder part of the modules. So it's like, uh, it doesn't really support that. But if you'd like to contribute, we can probably get that working. So, it, uh, they're, so the commands for that are, are built in and they are the build and also you can build pristine, um, which is essentially just build clean for the uninitiated. And uh, worst case, you can always del delete your build folder. But yes, I did name this uh, app Bobo. So uh, we are selecting that uh, target project. This is, it, it just popped it up. It's like, okay, I found a project in this folder. Let's, uh, this is your options, so I'm going to select that. And then um, it gave me a whole slew list of different boards. I'm just selecting the uh, Circuit Dojo Feather, Feather to enter Fund even 60 NS. And then, uh, and then that will persist no matter what. So if you close, your, if you close it and you reopen it, uh, it's going to be there no matter what. And if you ever need to change them, you can always change them using the change commands for either, the, either of them. Uh, and one thing that, let's see, and then we're going to be just running, so the, currently the flash, so we'll go jump over to the flash command. So the flash command uh, currently uses the NRF uh, JPROG, it's mostly tar targeted towards Nordic, but obviously you can be using a different, um, actually I think you're using, using West Flash, so you might get away with it if you're using a different platform. Um, but it, on, the, on, the, on the back end, it's just using West Flash, uh, so. And then uh, another option, at least for this, is if you are using MCU boot and you do have it connected to either a USB UART or maybe you actually have UART emulating as a, as a UART interface, you can actually load over MCU boot uh, as well. So using MCU manager, in this case, new manager. The, uh, the console access is handled by those, uh, again, the Zephyr tools I was referring to, those are just the written and Rust and it essentially just wrap around some of the uh, serial tools inside Rust. So the nice thing is uh, you'll be able to connect and kind of do whatever you need to to, to that device. You give uh, some options in terms of baud rates and things like that and it'll save everything, kind of like what I was mentioning before. So you can see here, that's the option and then the output is below. It's kind of cut off but you can see the, uh, the, uh, the boot uh, banner there for the device. So. And then that's the output of the log file. It's just piping everything to the log file. So let's jump out real quick. So this guy is bad boy. Let's see. All right. So it's all right here. There are some changes to it since, but um, what we're going to do, I'm going to create a new app a create project. I do have kind of a backup here because I do need to change a couple things as we run through it. So I'm selecting kind of the target folder uh, for the sake of time and everybody's patience. I'm, I already have all the dependencies loaded so we're just kind of creating the base folder to get this sample working. So we're setting that bad boy up here. It's going to just confirm it has everything in the right versions. And then you can see, you can see here that it was it was checking Python dependencies here, actually setting the requirements. Um, and this really depends if you're if you're jumping between different versions of Zephyr, then this is beneficial for you. If your version of Zephyr is not changing very often, then it's uh, kind of extra. But it don't really only you know it'll it's it's uh, it's not going to bother you that much. And uh, so we have that in place. So we have here, I'm going to get rid of the terminal real quick. So we have the standard kernel or standard Zephyr Blinky sample going on right here. Nothing else, nothing else crazy. I am going to, um, let's see if I can get this. So I'll just do that. So I'm going to throw in a hell of a world and I also have to configure the Boot loader. So I'm just copying these man, these guys. 
Um, so what I'm doing right here is, I, all I'm doing is uh, enabling the log uh, module and also just making sure that MCU boot is turned on. So for NCS, for anybody who have maybe have, it, have not worked with Nordics um, Connect SDK, is that when you have the bootloader enabled, it will, it will build and merge your bootloader with your application, so all you have to do is load it once. But in this case, um, I want the image that gets created for the purpose of OTA or, or loading it via the, boot, uh, the bootloader over UART. So we'll give it a build. So that, I'm moving too fast here, sorry guys. Um, this is the, uh, the build command right here. And you, you can see like if you just type several tools, they're all right here. And uh, it's building here in the background, so I'll let it chug along. Um, let's see what else is pertinent here as we go through it. So most likely it's already selected the board in the project, but we'll make sure when we do, actually it has because where it's building right now. So, and then what we'll be doing once it's actually done is we'll load it to the board. Oh yeah, it's complaining about the logger. We'll turn this in the print K instead. There we go, it's going. All right, so it's merged, it's uh, built and merged, and I'm just gonna load it. And the nice thing is that you kind of, you have the option to either load it, or you have the option to load and actually monitor it, so it'll connect it immediately to the device. And then the nice thing is like, you can actually set up the serial. So you can actually pull whatever serial port that you wanna be talking to, um, and that persists also, so. I'm just going to load it, and we'll go from there. Um, one thing that I did do on, on this guy is um, I wrote a little program. Actually, it's part of the Zephyr Tools app application, so you can definitely check it out. But um, I'm using an, a, a Silicon Labs USB UART chip, and one of the cool things you can do with it is you can control GPIOs. So what I did is I wrote some... I wrote some code to talk to the, that device so it would toggle a GPIO to, without having to press any buttons to put the device in the boot, NC bootloader mode. So just an option there. But you can see at the output there we have a little hello world. Um, that's something we just added. So we just went from, some crea from creating a project to all the way to building and flashing and actually reading out from it pretty quick. Obviously I've kind of skipped over the whole the, the, the setup part, but maybe I can show you guys where, where it lives. So this, this command right here, uh, this would actually detect your, uh, to detect your machine and then download the requisite SDK along with all the other tools that are com compatible with your processor um, to actually do these builds. So, and I can show you, I'm gonna pull it up in here. Uh, I can't use that. I can make this text a little bit bigger. So we're going to the Zephyr tools. So this is kind of where everything lives. And uh, tree, we'll do a little tree layer, layer three. And you can just kind of see um, there's different places for all the different uh, all the different applications. And all we're doing is just setting the path kind of magic automatically in, inside the um, application to or inside the, using the extension, it actually sets your path to the appropriate location depending on where you are. It also caches all the, uh, the downloads so you actually can, uh, you don't have to re-download them every time if maybe you want to kind of reset everything. Um, also setting, so in this end folder, you're getting your virtual environment. So those who like setting up a virtual environment for their development, it's all right there. And you can see, just scrolling through here, all the important bits that are related. Um, so we're just setting up environments for every single, uh, every single thing in the manifest. So, and one thing, uh, let me see if I can actually pull up the manifest so you guys have a better idea of actually what it looks like. Because I kind of showed the top of it, but I didn't actually go into the extent. 
So there's some hooks in here. You can, you can, it does a, actually, it does a check, hash check. So when you're actually downloading everything, it'll actually check the hash of the file and make sure it's actually correct. Um, and this actually gets bundled with the applications or with the extension. So, but there are certain things like setting suffixes and setting paths and making things a little bit more, uh, and setting envi an environment variable. So we're all, if you played around with Zephyr at all, everybody loves the dreaded uh, Zephyr toolchain variant and the Zephyr SDK install directory. Um, so all those are getting set as, as environment variables. Also to the point of that is not only does it set it as environment variables so you can access it with the tools, but it also what will allow you to, let me see. It'll also allow you to access all the, C oop, of course not. Um, if you have it set up correctly, it was complaining about the Zephyr path, so I have to double check. But you can run at least some of the utilities. So this, this like that, um, I, you'll get the Python environment. That's what it does. It'll get you the Python environment. So at least you can run West. You might have to, if you blow away your build folder, you might have to reset the um, the uh, Zephyr environment variables. But that's only for the command line. So again, another plug here. If uh, you like to see things improve, uh, I'd love to see some PRs from the community. That'd be awesome to make this kind of usable for everybody. Um, let's see. I think that. So we got those guys. So that's pretty much it for the demo, as much as I want to cover. So let's jump back into the uh, presentation. And then if you guys have questions, we definitely can go over them. Uh, so the ultimate summary here is that getting it to the point where it's cross-platform, it's easy to set up. Um, it applies in an opinion way, so it might not work with your, work, uh, your workflow completely, but it's an option um, if you like the way it is. Uh, Zephyr it makes it so we, there's so many ways to use Zephyr, so this is just one opinion way of doing it. And um, it's all open source. I got that link in the presentation before, and I mean, it's, it's a big, huge thanks to the Zephyr community and everybody who's been working on this project because uh, I'm, I'm standing on the, the shoulders of giants to some extent here. Um, this, uh, this QR code will get you just, uh, if you'd like to get every, all the slides, you can definitely check out that, the QR code and um, add yourself to the list and you'll get those sent right to your mailbox. Um, they're also available on the scheduling app, so uh, you can definitely download them there as well. And uh, yeah, does anybody have any questions? I'm not sure whether you said that, but did you actually run that on a Mac with an Intel processor, or? This is an Intel processor, processor yeah. Mac. And it, it, that is required, is that correct? You can, use a, you can use an ARM Mac or an Intel Mac. And it will, be, it will look the same? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank so the only, um, I think the only tool that I might not have fully compiled is the, is the MCU manager, um, just because I don't have a machine I can compile it on. But all the other tools are, like the CMake and the Ninja, and all those are um, already pre-compiled for M1 and M2, as far as I understand. And I've had customers that do have those machines, and they're like, yeah, everything works except for this one thing. So. Great. Thanks for the presentation. Really nice. Uh, not the question, but uh, actually note, uh, there is a PR for a new team manager, which increases the download speed to usable, fairly usable time, so. Oh, that's awesome. Check it out. It's so then I don't have to use my custom one anymore? <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Okay. I, I had the question as well. Um, so Nordic has its own VS Code extension, so you certainly know. Uh, yes. they, they don't, uh, you know, I was expecting a little bit more overlap. I came here with, you know, like, uh, there, there, isn't, there doesn't seem to be that much, but mm -hmm. have you thought about you know, bundling them together is, I'm not sure if the, I mean, I'm from Nordic, so I can ask around, but yeah. you know, I'm just, I'm just curious whether you've, because, because they, they would actually probably be a good combination together, yours and, and, and Nordic. So I don't know if you've yep. ever th th thought about, because I think you, you, BS Code support bundles of extensions, doesn't yes. it? Right. Um, that's a good question. So I, that's one thing I failed to mention is that uh, part of downloading this, it'll actually suggest you download a bunch of other extensions. Um, uh, Tron had actually reached out to me about his extension before it got merged into the uh, extension pack that you guys now have. Okay. So I was like, 
this is an awesome extension. I'm glad it got merged into theirs because that's one of the, so there are, there are two or three uh, Nordic extensions that get installed when you install uh, this particular okay, extension. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, it's not just this. There's actually, I should have mentioned that earlier. There's a lot of, um, so what like Jonathan was saying before, there's a list of suggested extensions that will get installed when you do install it. So thanks. it's not just this one. All right, thanks. <laughs> okay, so I have a question about the, uh, maybe a different scenario if you, for example, have a completely new hardware, you don't have any defined board, does your tool support uh, such use cases? So starting from scratch, for example, defining device tree board and stuff like that, how does it look like? That's a good question. So right now it scans through every, so if you have your own um, repository and you have your own boards directory, uh, it either right now it will actually find it, or we might have to add some extra code to make it look for it in the in the the home directory. Um, I haven't made a lot of like custom boards that are out of tree yet, so that I haven't really thought about it. But um, one thing that I have done out of tree a lot of was like drivers and uh, libraries and things like that. Uh, so um, I would have to. I don't have an exact answer because I haven't used that. I haven't been in that use case yet. But if it's missing and you think it's cool, then maybe we can add it. Uh, hello, I'd like to ask how this extension uh, compares to the platform you want. The platform IO? Yes. So um, this, the, the I, did, I haven't used platform IO very much. So it's, it's uh, I know for, for, for some people, all they want is, like the last talk when Jonathan was talking, one of the questions was like, how can we just get that like play button to get it to compile and load? And uh, I hope I've gotten to the point where like, at least you can like do that through the commands and maybe there's, I just never got around to like creating like the buttons and things like that. So um, the, the hard part for me and the hard part from my experience is like getting all the tool chain stuff installed and things like that, um, which I know kind of platform IO is doing as well. But um, it's kind of its own implementation away from platform IO. There's no, I'm not really reusing any of their technology or anything like that, so. Okay, thank you. The, the version and the paths are coded in the manifest, right? The, 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 the SDK, for example, the SDK version and the, the right. hash. So when a new version of the SDK comes, do you have to update your, your plugin? Yeah, if you want to update the, the SDK, then it, the, it has to be updated in the manifest, as it stands today. Okay, so it um, means that you have to monitor the changes around, yeah. and then to update your plugin every time the new yeah. version comes. And then you got to test it to make sure it works with the boards <laughs> that you're mostly supporting. Yeah, it can be a nightmare. Um, what I, I, this was like, the kind of what I was going back to what I was saying before is like, this was really hard for some of my customers to come from like, they have no idea how Zephyr works, they have no clue. So it was, it was basically like, install this, it'll do everything for you, and it's something that I've tested. So, but if it turns into something where there's people in the room that want to like help and contribute, then, then we can make it more advanced and make it do magical things, but um, <laughs> this, this, is, this is how it stands today. <laughs> And uh, let me see if I can pull this up back to Carl's question or point there. Is um, here's a list of all. I don't know if actually I can see. You can see all the extensions that. Oh, here we go. Let's try to scroll it up. So C C C plus plus the uh, device tree um, from Nordic K config from Nordic. And those are just kind of like the three, but there are a bunch of other ones that are very useful. Uh, Jonathan went over the talk over this in his talk earlier. Um, we have, let's see, I don't have them installed on this particular computer, but um, the uh, the the debugger, the Cortex debug um, extension, is also very handy. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks for coming about.